I'll just briefly introduce myself as the chair of this session. Uh, many of you were in the last session, so just to keep it quick, I'm Maddie Magneto Quick. I completed my PhD this year at Teherengawaka Victoria University of Wellington School of Design in Aotearoa, New Zealand, on the topic of farms and farm animal sanctuaries and the ways we can use creative design to tell new stories about those worlds that promise greater care and restorative justice for farmed animals. Just as some general housekeeping, uh, if you have any questions, there's a Padlet that has been posted on the side where you can uh, type in your questions for each presenter. And at the end of each presentation, there'll be time for you to put up your hands and to ask a question verbally if you would prefer. Also to let everyone know that our second presenter won't be presenting today, but we are wishing her well. So we only have two presenters this in this session. Uh, we have uh, Yoon Jung Kim first, so I will introduce you. And then once you're ready, you can get going. So Yoon Jung Kim is a PhD researcher at the University of Cologne in Germany. And her presentation is titled Fubao, It's a Miracle I Met You, How Female Panda Fans Are Transforming Human Animal Relationships in South Korea. So when you're ready, uh, you can get started. Um, so yeah, over to you. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Yoon Jung Kim from the University of Cologne, Germany. It's an honor to present at AIP 2024 as a doctor student in anthropology, especially since I first presented in AIP 2021 as a master's student. The opportunity I, AIP provided me was invaluable, and I'm grateful to share my work again at this conference. It was a rainy morning at 9.30, 30 minutes before Everland, South Korea's largest theme park opened. Since summer vacation has ended, I hope the park wouldn't be too crowded. However, Hanel sent me a message urging me to arrive early. When I arrived, hundreds of people were already lined up, proving Hanel was right. Next to the regular line stands relaxed looking season ticket holders for quick entry. I noticed that they were all carrying Bao family merchandises. 10 minutes before the gates opened, I remembered Hannah's advice to download the app and use the smart queuing feature for quicker access to pandas. I set up the app and waited as a crowd prepared to dash inside. 20 minutes later, I entered the panda house. Due to the Bao family's fame, Everland created an exhibition before reaching the pandas, but most visitors bypassed it to join the line. Unaware of this norm, I ended up at the very back. At last, I reached the panda enclosure. Despite limiting the number of visitors, one must fight through the crowds to see the pandas. Pandas were just lying around eating bamboo, but their every movement drew gasps from the crowd. After the 10 minutes viewing time was up, I made up my way to the exit to the gift shop. I messaged Hanu to let her know I was done. She replied that the crowd wasn't so too bad today, so she might manage 10 sushi. She invited me to join her in line for the next sushi, a term fans use for the cycle of viewing pandas, leaving and lining up again like conveyor belt sushi. Hanu shared that she once managed over 20 sushi in one day, staying from opening to closing, lining up to see the pandas repeatedly. This study examines Fubao, the first giant panda born through natural breeding in South Korea, and her female fans' aunties to explore how they engage with non-human lives and participate politically. Born in 2020, Fubao's growth documented on social media with the zoo leveraging South Korean kinship cosmology by framing Fubao as the zookeeper's granddaughter and her fans as aunties. This study argues that these aunties extend care beyond biological kinship, challenging patriarchal family structures while reclaiming the public spare to inc include women and animals. First, I will briefly introduce the Fubao effect. While famous Jew animals such as Knut, the Berlin Jew's polar bear, gained renown, Fubao and her family became an online and offline phenomenon with impact extending beyond South Korea. Born during the COVID-19, Fubao gained some recognition as Korea's panda. Her popularity skyrocketed in 2023 when questions about the treatment of these pandas from China erupted. 
In April 2023, Yaya, a panda loaned to the Memphis Jew in 2003, was repatriated to China following widespread criticism of her poor conditions. This, along with the death of Lora and another panda in Thailand, heightened concerns about the welfare of pandas abroad. Amid this discourse, Fubao's well-documented happy life in South Korea drew attention and became viral. Everland reinforced Fubao's appeal by creating a family narrative and sharing video of her growth, featuring the zookeeper's interactions with her. This strategy led to a surge in follow followers of for Everland social media channels, as you can see in the graphs. This is the point when the Fubao got internationally famous. And in 2024, the channel had more than 200,000 followers. Her popularity led to entertainment shows, movies, and the city gave Fubao and her sisters South Korean birth certificates, as you can see here. The Fubao effect significantly boosted Everland's profits, which soared 126% in 2023. However, Fubao's planned repatriation to China in April 2024 created debates about panda diplomacy as Fubao's status as Chinese property caused discomfort in public. This, combined with lingering biases against affection for non-human animals, fueled backlash against undies. Media coverage of 6,000 fans cheerfully saying farewell to Fubao was met with public ridicule, with some calling Fubao a chink bear, a term used to disregard Chinese, and mocking the auntie's devotion to what they framed as China's diplomatic tool. While nationalism partly explains this backlash, I believe we need to see more gendered aspect of this scene. Previous studies on famous animals have examined whether animals can be considered celebrities, the factors driving panda celebrity status, and how capitalism transforms animals into lively capital. Also, research on panda diplomacy and biopolitical critiques of Fubao's case has been conducted. While acknowledging these critiques, this study focuses on the relationships between Fubao and aunties, particularly how their affection influences the lives of panda and other animals. This study expands on my 2021 AIP presentation, where I discuss South Korean animal media viewers forming effective relationship with animal protagonists. At that time, I focused primarily on women in their 20s and their online practices, but did not address why most of my informants were women. Over the past three years, South Korea's animal media landscape has shifted. Despite viewers' efforts, there are ongoing cases of animal abuse in media that led many of my informants to stop viewing videos of individual animal creators. But the FUBO phenomenon was different. Unlike the younger demographic in my earlier research, Fubao's core audience consisted largely of women in their 30s to 50s, many of whom had little prior interest in animal media. This observation prompted new research questions. How can we explain the intimate relationships human women form with specific non-human animals without reinforcing essentialist nature-women connections? How do these women, marginalized by ageism, discrimination, and a lack of expertise in animal studies, advocate for other species in their own unique ways? How can human female affection for non-human female animals foster broader social changes? To answer these questions, I employed the following research methods. Given my presence in Germany, I primarily relied on the immersive cohabitation method, where we focus on the blurred boundaries between digital landscape and offline world. According to Blue Tail, immersive cohabitation requires constructing a digital self and conducting fieldwork that includes daily interaction over an extended period, forming social relationships, and establishing a presence in the field through creating and sharing contents. In July 2023, I joined the online Everland animal community under the nickname Marama Pepse. I engaged actively by commenting on posts, sharing my thoughts about the Bao family, and participating in online petitions. After integrating myself into the field, I conducted one month of online participation observation at Everland and interviewed ardent Bao family fans, mostly women in their 40s and 50s. I also attended several meetings with undies. 
Hanel is a devoted fan of the entire Bao family, but holds a special affection for Fu Bao's mother, Ai Bao. Among the fans I reached out, I particularly hoped Hanel would agree to an interview. As one of the community's longest standing members, she posts multiple posts every day, including articles about animal welfare. When I met Hanel for the first time, she struck me as well as well prepared for a long day at the zoo. She wore comfortable hiking clothes, carried large water, a hat to shelter from the heat, and even wore cooling arm sleeves. Once we sat down, she proudly showed me her foldable chair. There was no time limit before Fubao became famous, she explained. I would go in and just stay. I didn't eat, I didn't drink. There's no restroom in there, no place to sit. I just looked at the pandas for hours. I usually go at 10 a.m. and stayed until 3.30. Five hours just sitting there. Hanel first encountered Bao family during the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020 when she came across a YouTube video of Ai Bao giving birth to Fu Bao. The scene left a lasting impression. She came to Korea so young, knowing nothing with no one to guide her, Hanel said. But she gave birth alone. I have never married or had children, but it really touched my heart and made me cry. Like Hanel, many of the aunties are related deeply to the mother-daughter bond between Ai Bao and Fu Bao. Regardless of their marital status or whether they have children of their own, I've encountered numerous posts expressing heartbreak over Ai Bao's journey, giving birth to her three daughters in a foreign country, only to face the inevitability of parting with them due to contractual obligations. For Hanel, her connection with Ai Bao feels almost spiritual. She shares story of predicting the birth of Ai Bao's twins in a dream. On July 1st, I woke up screaming and kicking my blanket, she recounted. I shouted, they are twins. My mother ran into my room asking what was wrong. And at that exact moment, the twin pandas were born. Second, their identity as auntie of Fubao has had a significant impact on their self-esteem within a patriarchal society. During my online field work, I came across numerous posts detailing how their active participation as auntie of a Bao family, especially spending money on merchandise and making donations, caused conflicts with their husbands or in-laws. Some have even hidden the merchandise they purchased and faced mockery for not acting their age. Others have had to argue with their in-laws about using their money, although it is not their husband's money, to buy these items. Although these, these situations can be stressful, they also empower these women, giving them the confidence to assert their right to spend their own money as they wish. I encounter various personal stories about the Fubao means to aunties. For some, Fubao has been a source of strength in difficult times even helping some reduce their reliance on antidepressants. However, like their in-laws' disregard for their affection toward the panda, many people dismiss their deep connection to Fubao as the behavior of crazy women, much like how women are stereotyped as sentimental or animal ladies. The disdain toward aunties and animals often grows to their desire to be more protective, which will become clearer in the final part of this presentation. This intense emotional connection aunties have to the Bao family and the backlash they receive can be understood through the lens of critical auntie studies. In the book Indifference, Dave argues, quote, the answer to the question, why is more attention to the animal so repulsive, cannot be settled entirely by its link to fascism or the effective history of European liberalism, all of which tie back to the heteropatriarchal fundaments grounding fascism and liberalism queer non-reproductivity, the hatred of women, and the fear of conversion or fear of the end of the world." End of quote. According to Kupchantini, Tani, aunties are women, famous, and queer figures who exist at the periphery of nuclear family formations and the institutions that uphold heteropatriarchal and capitalistic ideologies. Auntie may refer to a biological or generational relation, but can also describe strangers. As kin, aunties blur the boundaries of family with the capacity to both surveil and subvert its confines. Drawing on this understanding of aunties, I aim to focus on their performative aspects, especially how they secure their pseudo kinship relationship with animal, despite the backlash of male, human dominant society. 
I interpret their actions as political and subversive, affecting both human and animal's lives. The power of aunties is particularly evident in how they have managed to incorporate women and animals into the public sphere. After Fubao was sent to China, the affection of aunties was disregarded, and various agents attempted to silence the women amid allegations that the Chinese Panda Center has mistreated Fubao. Upon hearing the allegations, the aunties first reached out to Everland, asking if they could either bring Fubao back or speak out for their well-being. However, Everland, as a private enterprise focused on profit, dismissed their concerns, stating there was nothing wrong with China's treatment of Fubao. What hurt the aunties most was a response from the Duke keeper, Fubao's grandfather, who said, those who deeply reflect on anthropomorphizing Fubao tend to struggle. While anthropomorphizing Fubao should be avoided, this comment felt deeply hurtful since Everland had actively used the family narrative to promote Bao family. The response implied that women's love for animals was irrational and emotional. At the Sonshu Pingyi Panda base in China, where Fubao is currently residing, there is an allegation that several influencers and staff members, excluding the aunties, met to discuss Fubao's treatment. Their protocol showed they were aware of the large group of aunties supporting Fubao, but chose to silence them by ignoring their demands. The South Korean public's reaction was harsh as well, particularly on male-dominated online spaces. They captured and mocked the women who were crying while saying goodbye to Fubao. Some even compared the pandas to historical figures or the fans' parents, questioning whether they will cry for these people over the animals. This line of reasoning revealed speciesism, devaluing animals in favor of humans, anti-China sentiment, and the stereotype that women are overly sentimental while men remain rational. On September 8, 2024, I was invited by animal activist group to participate in a meeting with the aunties of Bao family. The aunties discussed how they could advocate for animal welfare in South Korea beyond Fubao. What struck me most was their awareness of the mockery they faced. One said, drawing attention is our specialty. Even if we are criticized, if it means that the animal situation gains more visibility, we don't mind being insulted. Their strategy aligns with Fedorenko's research on idol advertisements in South Korean subways. Fedorenko suggests that instead of viewing fans who place these idol ads, uh, as you can see in the picture, as mere consumers of celebrity culture, they should be seen as urban dwellers repurposing public spaces because these idol um, advertisements are everywhere in South Korea, especially subways. Drawing on Lefebvre's concept of the right to the city, Fedorenko argues that reclaiming urban spaces allows women, often marginalized, to assert their presence and participate politically in shaping their cities. In South Korea, women's right to public spaces is increasingly threatened by heightened gender antagonism in a patriarchal society. Backlash against women has created various misogynic online forums and real-world violence, such as the 2016 Gangnam murder case where a man killed the first random woman he met in a public toilet. Animals are not exception from this hatred. In 2021, the Gore specialty chat room became infamous for sharing graphic images of animal torture and killing. In this context, the aunties provocative political actions carry powerful messages advocating for women's and animals' rights. Their efforts demand inclusion in both the urban and digital pub public spheres, challenging exclusions and asserting a shared right to participate in shaping society. These are the political actions that has been going on among aunties. First, they occupied online spaces by organizing national and international petitions for Fubao's improved living condition in China and launching intense hashtag movements on Twitter. Recognizing that many aunties in their 40s and 50s were unfamiliar with Twitter, detailed guides were shared covering everything from how to create accounts to maximizing hashtag visibility. They sent protest trucks to the Chinese embassy in Everland and staged protest performances in, in front of Chinese embassy. They also funded an advertisement in New York's Times Square 
Currently, their efforts include advocating for amendments to the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species to stop forced breeding, challenge China's panda di diplomacy, and oppose the compulsory return of pandas to China. Beyond Fubao, the Bao Family Alliance has protested against taxidermy and demanded better conditions for zoo animals. Their collective mobilization, particularly among economically empowered women in their 40s to 50s, has pressured Jews to stop purchasing new animals and improve existing conditions. While this could be welfare washing, as in our uh, conference we talked about it a lot, this shows that corporations and governments are aware of public scrutiny of Jew animal welfare. Pandas and Jews raise complex issues, complex issues, including China's panda diplomacy, the exploitation of exhibit animals, and the anthropomorphization of wildlife. While acknowledging these critiques, this study emphasizes how human, particularly female, affection for animals can drive social changes. Even after Hu Bao's departure to China, the aunties' advocacy for animal welfare persists, intersecting with South Korea's feminist movement to include women and animals in public spaces, both on and offline. The scene is constantly evolving and requires continued attention. Uh, these are my references. Thank you very much for listening. Okay, we will move on to the next uh, presentation. So we have Natalie Schuler, for, who is an undergrad at the University of Agricultural Sciences and Veterinary Medicine of Cluj-Napoca in Romania. And her presentation is titled Ethical Veganism and Horseback Riding. So Natalie, whenever you're ready, um, you can take it over from me. Okay, so before I start, I wanted to just introduce myself. So my name is Natalie. I'm a vegan and a horseback rider for some years. <laughs> and this subject is a very interesting one and was a really interesting um, thematic for me to look into. So uh, it's called Ethical Veganism and Horseback Riding. Is there a possible reconciliation? So we're going to go into the dilemma, then we're going to approach some ethical uh, approaches, and then we're going to try and identify some potential solutions to uh, this, let's say, problem. So first, uh, we have to start with the concept of uh, ethical veganism. Um, I have here a uh, definition of what ethical veganism is supposed to be. That's a moral opposition to any actions, action that exploits animals. And it's not, it's not just about choices of diet, but about choices relating to what the person wears, what personal care products a person uses, their hobbies, their jobs. And basically it's just a viewpoint uh, that affects every aspect uh, of a person's life. And I like this uh, definition because it emphasizes the difference between a person that just um, follows a plant-based diet versus a an ethical vegan that uh, goes way beyond that and tries to take into consideration any aspects that uh, involve an animal. Um, so first we have to um, think and see the dilemma of horseback riding in the context of ethical veganism. And I kind of took the um, viewpoint of um, some people on the Reddit um, site. And uh, I selected three main concerns uh, that were among them. The first one is the forced movement and training in horses. Basically, they say that uh, equestrians use restrictive gear like bits, spurs, or whips, and they can cause physical and uh, psychological stress. Then we have the second concern that is the erasure of individuality, that's reducing the horse to a tool for human use, erasing its status as a sentient being. And then we have the third one, the captive environment. The horses are kept in, in, in environments that necessitate human interventions um, for their well-being, like stables and just uh, micromanaging the horse um, by the owner. 
And now we can go into the comments that I selected. Um, the first one is basically um, saying that young forces are often taught to learn helplessness, where the saddle is strapped to them and it's basically just kept there until they learn to just accept it and stop resisting. Uh, I wanted to say here that uh, learn helplessness uh, basically means that the horse, um, after repeatedly trying to escape a painful or uh, aversive stimulus, cannot um, escape. So it's basically a learned behavior that the uh, non-human animal is uh, exhibiting uh, after a a stressful or just a traumatic event. And for that, I have video that um, emphasizes uh, what we can do to just stop uh, this behavior to uh, exhibit. And I hope it works. <laughs> So basically what he's saying in this video is the fact that uh, we as horse partners, we should start the horse in a soft manner and in a slow manner because uh, they are individuals and they need to know and understand what's happening to them. So if we start them slow, then this learned helplessness will not be present anymore because of the methods that we use. The second comment I found is uh, regarding and talking about the weight. So also weight perpendicular to one's spine against gravity only increases the chances of long-term chronic uh, physical illness. And I found some, some studies that you can find online uh, about this exact topic and it's proven that horses should only be carrying about 10 to 20 percent of their own body weight when being ridden and at this maximum being 20 percent there is a substantial effect on the horse's gait and behavior responses uh, to the rider's weight and in these studies they also included the age of the horse the horse condition the level and duration of work the saddle fit and the rider ability and balance and then i have another study uh, that I found. It was done in 2008 at an Ohio University and it also analyzed the impact of rider and tack weight. They monitored the horses for heart rate, breathing rate, uh, rectal uh, temperature when carrying loads of 50, um, 15, 20, 25 and 35 uh, percent of their own body weight and they found out that an average adult uh, light ridden horse could comfortably carry about 20 20%. And this also goes into the um, values with the Certified Horsemanship Association and the Cavalry Manuals of Horse Management. That's a manuscript that was published in uh, 1920. And it's a basically a um, foundation for how you should take care of horses and uh, the anatomy of the horse and so on. And basically, um, they also analyzed the 25 and 35 percent, that's only with 5 percent more than the actual 20 percent rule, and they found out that um, it could have negative effects on the uh, biomechanical, uh, physiological, biochemical, and behavioral, uh, behavioral uh, parameters of the horse, even if it's just with the 5 percent more. So, um, we can still take that into account when we want to ride a horse that we should be only, we should weight only the, uh, only 20% of the horse's body weight in order for the horse to not suffer uh, chronic physical illness on the long term. And then we have the third comment, uh, riding horses is not vegan, period. They need to be broken. There's no way of getting consent or knowing if they're uncomfortable. First, I think people have um, a problem with the term of breaking a horse. It's a 6,000 years old term. It's just a term, it's just a word. Uh, broke, broken, green broke, and that broke, uh, all terms um, are mean that um, the horse can be ridden. If it's unbroke, it means that it can the horse can't be ridden. 
and the, the, there is some connotation between the word and people getting really uncomfortable when talking to, about this uh tactic because they think that breaking a horse means breaking the horse's spirit and trying to dominate the horse and bend its will to the trainer by a struggle and through some uh, really traumatic um, events and techniques but that's not the case uh, nowadays we use the term of starting a horse uh, starting it uh, starting the horse under the saddle and the techniques that uh, people use nowadays are much more humane than they were in the past. And for that, I have another video. So uh, what we can see in the video is the fact that uh, it's about the getting consent in a horse. Uh, you can see that the horse is willingly uh, approaching the trainer and willingly just staying there and allowing the trainer to put the, uh, the gear on and uh, the equipment on. Uh, and the horse is not uh, exhibiting any kind of stressful behavior that could mean that uh, the horse is uncomfortable with what's been done. Uh, and I think because they are sentient being and because they can suffer and e express happiness and sadness, they can also express uh, when they want to take part in some um, activities that we want them to take part in. Um, and for that, I actually uh, analyze some uh, consent-based approach First, we have the agreement, the permission to mount, and then we have the asking for consent when being bridled. And I think it's really interesting that, I know I have a few videos here, but it's really important for people to see the actual uh, body language of the horse, because you can't work with an animal if you don't know uh, the animal's body language. So first we have, we have this one. Uh, so she really talks about. Uh, so she really talks about getting consent from the horse when uh, mounting uh, the horse and when starting to do any kind of activity. And I think that's really good because there are some micro expression that the horse can express when not uh, wanting to do anything with you. And then we have this one. And here you can also see that uh, the person uh, that was asking the horse to do something, she was basically waiting for the horse to just engage with her. And uh, she was pausing if the horse was just leaning off the, the bridle, she was pausing and waiting for the horse to come back at her. And even when she was leading the horse away, she was not um, tagging the horse or just uh, doing some kind of uh, aggressive action she was just waiting patiently for the horse to uh, engage in what she was trying to do with the horse and now we have some um, um, behavior that basically mean the refusal of the horse and a non-consensual relationship to what's being done to to the horse 
And here I have some trigger warning because, um, yeah, it's 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 a bit sad when you see that. So just be mindful. <laughs> Okay, so uh, in this video, we can see that the person is trying to bridle the, the horse and to put the bit in, inside the mouth of the horse. And the horse is basically rejecting that uh, by lifting uh, the head up, by just uh, opening uh, his mouth. And those are basically non-consensual reactions that a horse can exhibit while um, taking part into an action. And uh, we as equestrians should take that into account when working with an animal because um, it's a sentient being and it's a living being and we have to take uh, into consideration the how he feels or how she feels. Um, it's basically just in humans. You know, we don't want to do our friends a bad thing or to put our friends in a bad experience uh, just because we're selfish or just because we want uh, to do something. There are a lot of options that we can use and alternatives. And now I have another video of the negative reaction to being kept in a stable. And this is also a trigger warning. So basically you can see here that the horse is exhibiting some uh, stressful behavior, the tongue flicking, the eyes are really swollen, basically the whole head is in a in tension uh, because we should always uh, take into account that we have to provide the horse with some natural um, environment that they will live in in the in, in the nature so not really keeping them in in confined environments and in close stables and not letting them out here i have some training and care methods that respect the horse's welfare we have the ethical methods for example we can use the positive reinforcement training the clicker training we can do bitless riding saddle fitting is very important because a lot of the problems that they, the horse is having is because we don't want to invest in a good saddle fitter or we just don't want to educate ourselves on what it means to have a good fitted saddle we should use uh, we shouldn't use spurs or whips, and we should really emphasize the importance of the of ground working with uh, the horse. And uh, we as riders should have a correct equitation. That means the way you're sitting on a horse, or the way you're just um, presenting yourself when riding your horse, because the horse shouldn't be carrying you. You should be carrying your own weight. And then we have to take into consideration of uh, horseshoes. Uh, because I've seen a lot of people that uh, really don't like uh, the horseshoes that are being put on the horse. And that's because the hoof of the horse basically acts as an um, um, shock absorbance. Uh, so it basically it, uh, it uh, expands when pressure is being put on the foot and then it retracts when the pressure is being uh, taken off the foot. And then we have a, some natural and stimulating care. We can apply natural training methods like liberty uh, or just um, explore, uh, exploration of the yeah. environment. We can apply planned enrichment. We should let our horse to socialize with other horses through the outdoor freedom that we should uh, give to the horse. And we um, have to allow the horse to um, and encourage the horse for to show natural behaviors because that's really important for the psychology of the horse and for uh, for the horse's mental health basically. Um, and here I have some ethical methods that uh, I've previously talked about. Uh, first of all, we have the liberty training for one for the ones who do not know what that is. It's really beautiful.
So you can see the horse that um, he's basically doing some dresses, dressage, dressage movements, uh, but they're not forced. He is taking um, liberate action in, uh, in that kind of activity. He wants to do that. He's not forced. He's not uh, being uh, bridled to do that or something. He just wants to take part into what's uh, happening there. And then we have this one. I did this with my own horse as well. So basically we have to get our horses used to anything that's new and that's scary because uh, in the wild they would do that with their own mates, with their own families. But since we have so many horses that we maybe rescue or uh, take into our own homes and farms, uh, we have to get them used to uh, experience a lot of things. It's, it's just like in humans, you know, the first time you have um, take uh, ridden a, a bicycle or um, you you saw some stairs for the first time or you put on some shoes those were really scary things but once you see that uh, there is nothing that you should be scared of then the actions become uh, more easy for you to 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 make to do and then we have uh, some natural and stimulating care, the natural behavior that I was talking about, but this is just uh, some grooming. I have a picture after that, and this is plain enrichment. This is very important for horses to play with something in their environment because it stimulates their uh, mental and their cognition and they try to figure out how the ball works, for example, and how they can interact with the ball. And uh, that's really important because if you have a horse that doesn't live with another horse or with other animals, you need to just uh, try and think and apply some enrichment tactics. Uh, so this is a video of me uh, when I was working at the farm with some horses. I usually would take them out for walks. And uh, that was a really good uh, way of stimulating them because they could just uh, sniff their environment and just interact with anything that was there and see the cars, see other people and so on. And yes. And this was... Basically, she was just um, eating some leaves and so on. And I would usually walk them for uh, up to an hour or something. So it was a really great experience for them. I would always ride them and so on, but I would try to include some other activities. And uh, this is another picture of... Um, Sorry, this is another picture of um, me working with that horse where I would usually let uh, her express natural behavior like grooming. Uh, it's a really, really important behavior that uh, people don't usually understand. When you're scratching a horse and he comes and just grooms at you, that's uh, telling, hey, I love you, I like what you're doing, uh, keep doing that. And for some uh, final thoughts, uh, we have some uh, recap key takeaways. So basically ethical veganism seeks to minimize harm and respect animal autonomy. Horseback riding while uh, continuous can align with uh, vegan principles through informed and humane practice and methods like pitless riding, positive reinforcement and providing natural living conditions can significantly improve horse welfare. And then we have a, we need to have a balanced perspective that's avoiding horseback riding is one approach, but adopting ethical uh, practices offers a pathway for those who wish to engage while prioritizing animal well-being and uh, promoting understanding and empathy in human animal relationships benefit both species. And I have a quote that em emphasizes compassion and coexistence. And I really like this quote. It says that the greatness of a nation can be judged by the way its animals are treated.